Have you ever noticed how a render can have almost everything going for it? Like really good modeling, really good materials, really good lighting, and yet it still looks distinctly like a render. You're not sure what it is, but something about it just feels fake. Now, most of the time this could be anything, but this video is gonna focus on one mistake in particular, one that 99.99% .99 of you watching this don't even realize is happening. And if you're not interested in photorealism right now, you should still watch this because this mistake affects everyone. When you correct it, you'll be able to have light that feels like real lighting. You'll get more freedom and you'll be able to create scenes that just feel more believable. But first, we need to go back to our original problem. Why do some renders, despite having everything else right, still feel fake? Well, to talk about photorealism, you need to talk about cameras. And in this case, specifically how cameras see light. Because it may surprise you to learn that the way Blender sees light and the way cameras see light are quite different. So you know how sometimes when you take a photo of someone against a background, their face looks really dark? So then you select their body and then the background becomes really bright? This is due to the exposure point. If you have something dark and something bright in the same photo, the camera can only show one of them in exposure. It does this by looking at that point and then adjusting the settings of the camera, namely the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, until that point sits at middle gray. Now the camera will show things that are brighter and darker than middle gray, but only to a certain point. So for example, you can see in this photo, hello, that the dark detail in the background is lost and the bright detail in the jacket is lost. This is sometimes called clipping and it's really bad. The amount of information that the camera can see on either side of the middle gray value is called the dynamic range of the camera. The more dynamic range, the better the camera and the better the final image. A cheap compact camera can see at about 10 or 11 f-stops, which is the unit that's used to measure the dynamic range. DSLRs are a little bit better, seeing from around 10 to 14 stops, and the Ari Alexa, which is the camera that most big budget movies are now shot on, sees at 14.5 stops. But the best of all is our eyesight, seeing at an estimated 15 to 20 stops of dynamic range. So, what range does Blender have? Unfortunately, a pitiful eight stops. That means that by default, you're rendering at a far worse range than even a crappy compact camera. And to make things worse, Blender also has an arbitrarily high middle gray exposure point, meaning you have less room for brightness. Now together, these create some pretty big problems for your scene. So as an example, I'm just gonna light this scene here and I'm gonna show you why this uh, compressed dynamic range yeah, causes problems for us, okay? So I got a pretty basic scene here, got a dining room, got some chairs, and I wanna have some sunlight streaming in through this window over there, okay? So you can see I've got a sun lamp over here and what I might do in this situation is go into rendered view mode and what I'm gonna do is just increase the sun lamp until it looks bright enough. Cause you can see by default, you know, one is pretty low. So I'll just increase this um, until it looks about right. Now I don't wanna go too bright because obviously you don't want it to look like there's a big supernova outside the window or whatever. So I'm just gonna increase it as far as I can until I start to lose detail. So you can see it around about 17, 20, something like that, that I'm starting to lose some detail in the chair and the table and especially the wall there. So I know that this is now, you know, it looks about the right uh, brightness for the sun, okay? But when I give this a render, you'll notice two things. For one, you can see that the sun lamp is actually too bright because I'm actually losing a lot of detail in the table and the wall there. But not only that, but the rest of the room looks really dark. And this is a really common thing you see in Blender. Like the scene just feels dark. Have you ever noticed that? So as artists, what would we do? Well, 
in this situation, what I've done in the past is I've done some cheating, okay? So I go back in here and I go, okay, well, if there's not enough light coming from the sun, what I'll do is I'll increase the amount of, uh, of fill light, like the skylighting. So I might increase this to, I don't know, 50, like really, really exaggerate. Just try and pump in as much light as I can into the rest of the room. Um, or I might actually um, exaggerate the bounce lighting off the wall there. So I might, uh, you know, select that table there and I'll add in a lamp. Um, um, by the way, this is the wrong way, okay? I'm showing you now, <laughs> just, just as a reminder. This is uh, an example of some of the problems that uh, this, this dy reduced dynamic range creates. Okay, so I might, you know, add in a lamp like this. Now, this, this is fairly common, okay? And that would, you know, bounce some light off there and, you know, I would feel like, as an artist, yeah, I fixed it, you know. Okay, but when you think about it, this workflow makes absolutely no sense. Okay, from a physical standpoint, why would we need to add fake hidden lighting coming off the wall or, you know, really exaggerate sky lighting uh, to this scene? Because for proof, here is the reference. Okay, so this is actually my dining room and I took this photo with my iPhone. Now you can see that in the reference, when we compare it to our render, the reference looks far brighter, okay? The room is filled with lighting. There is enough light coming off that sun there to light up the room. I obviously don't have any hidden lamps going on under the table like I did in my render. And yet, there is adequate lighting, almost an, an abundance of lighting. It's crazy bright in there, just from that bounce lighting of the sun. So why didn't it work in Blender? Well it all falls back to that reduced dynamic range, that crushed, compressed dynamic range. Because what's actually happening is when the when we set the sun lamp value for our sun, so let me just grab it here again. So I decided that it was around about, oh, actually I should probably delete that other stuff. I'll set that back to what it was before. So back back to the original problem here. So I when I set the sun lamp value here, I set it around about 20 because that's what looked right. And when I say right, I mean, you know, it, it felt like the value of the sun. So I felt like 20 was about the brightness of the sun. But actually, the real sun should be much, much brighter than what we're used to doing in Blender. Like most of us don't go really above 20 or anything like that when we're lighting a scene. But the real sun is magnitudes brighter than what we're setting it in Blender. The only reason that it looks so bright in this situation is because of that crushed dynamic range. So if we could fix the dynamic range, if we could uh, extend the dynamic range to be bigger than this, then we can increase the sun lamp to be far, far brighter, which is what it should be. Uh, and that would then light up the rest of the scene naturally without having to do any cheating whatsoever. So. I'm hoping that you can understand that this is a really simple scene, very basic environment. And these are the problems that we'd run into with just this simple scene with a more complex, you know, huge, you know, production ready type of scene. The problems just build up and build up and build up. Or to use a quote by Alex Fry, why does that atmosphere layer look terrible? Because there isn't enough light filtering through the scene. And why is that? Because the sky has been graded down. And why has the sky been graded down? because it was clipping. Why was it clipping? Because we were using a too simple zero to one transform on a high dynamic range floating point image. Don't worry, we'll get to that. Lights don't bounce enough, things don't flare enough, and pings don't pop enough. So, what the hell, Blender? Now you might think that the solution would be to jump ship to another renderer, but actually many of those suffer from the exact same problem. Blender's not alone here. The solution is to actually change the color management configuration that Blender uses to render. Now I know this sounds odd, so let me explain briefly what color management has to do with dynamic range. So when you take a photo, the camera is storing that image as ones and zeros. And before your display can actually read it, it has to be converted. And this is where a color transform is used. Now, maybe you've heard of them before. They have scary names like Rec 709, Log, and 3DL, etc. Different ones are used depending on the camera and the intended display. Well, 3D renderers are no different. Before you can see the render, a color transform is used to convert the ones and zeros from your virtual camera into colors that your monitor can actually see. And this brings us finally to the root cause of the problem. Blender is using the sRGB color transform, and this is bad news. 
because sRGB was originally designed to approximate the response of a CRT monitor. This thing is vintage. It was never designed for rendering, nor should it ever be used for rendering. So if you're thinking like I was when I first heard this, how on earth could Blender have been using the wrong color transform for all these years without anyone noticing? Well, the reason it's gotten by for so long is that color is actually extremely technical and there are actually very few color experts in the world that understand it 100%. So when sRGB was chosen many years ago, it's likely that no one actually even knew that it was incorrect. And years later, even if someone did notice, it's difficult to convince the user base to change when one, most users don't even see a problem, and two, they're used to the way their lighting behaves with sRGB. In order for Blender to change, the user base first needs to understand why it's broken, and then, and only then, can a push be made for it to be changed by default. Speaking of which, if you wanna help, a really simple thing you can do is actually press like on this video. That'll help it show up in more people's recommended YouTube videos, which will slowly educate more of the community. So hopefully the solution I'm about to propose can be made default sometime in the future. Now I want to repeat that regardless of whether you're making cute cartoony images, motion graphics, or photorealistic images, sRGB should not be used for rendering. It mangles your color data and creates problems that ripple through your scene. So, what is the solution? Can we finally get to it? The solution is to use a custom color management configuration called Filmic Blender. Filmic Blender was developed by Troy Sabotka, an industry professional who saw the problem in Blender and wanted to do something about it. So he created this custom color system which emulates ACES, which is the industry standard color space now in use by nearly every major Hollywood film. Now, remember dynamic range? Well, Filmic Blender allows you to go from eight stops to 25 stops of dynamic range. When you start using Filmic Blender, you'll notice that you don't get those harsh hotspots anymore. The lighting faller feels smoother. Not only that, but you can start using accurate light values, increasing the bounce lighting and getting natural looking scenes without needing to cheat. And best of all, it's free. Troy could have charged $200 for this and I still would have paid for it, but he wants to change Blender for the better. So he's graciously giving it away for nothing. So to download Filmic Blender, click the link in the YouTube description, which will take you through to this website. Now there's a bit of information here, how to install it, how to use it, etc. To download it, what you wanna do is click on view GitHub and that'll take you through to the uh, GitHub interface, which always confuses me. Uh, the way to download it is by clicking on the clone or download button and then download zip. Okay, it's a very small download, uh, but once you've downloaded it, you should see um, when you unzip it, unzip it to any random folder, doesn't really matter. But once you see it, you should see uh, inside, you've got a bunch of uh, folders that look like this. Okay, so just keep that there. And what we're gonna do is load up where Blender is installed and I'll show you where we're gonna move that folder to. So if you're on Windows, which stats tell me that that's where the majority of my viewers are from. Uh, if you're on Windows, you'll find Blender installed under the C drive, Program Files, Blender Foundation, Blender, and then the version of Blender that you're using, the latest one, um, I've got 2.78, so double click that. And then underneath that, click on Data Files. And then here you'll see three folders color management fonts locale. Okay, this is the place that we're going to drag that folder. Okay, so I'm gonna copy that, hit Control C, and then Control V it over here and hit continue. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, so this, this new folder here, this is actually gonna replace this folder. So just so that Blender doesn't use this one, but I've still got it if I, in case I wanted to go back to it, I'm just gonna rename it by hitting F2, then underscore old backup and hit continue, okay? So that Blender won't be able to see it, but it's there if we wanted to. Now with this one, making making sure that it's this inside, right? I'm gonna rename that color management and click continue, okay? So that's what you've done. So again, checking, make sure data files, inside color management, you see this directly underneath that folder. Okay, so to check that it is installed properly, go ahead and open up Blender. <laughs> All right, 
So if you go to the color management section of Blender, which you'll find underneath the scene panel, and then down here underneath color management to check that it is installed properly. If you see underneath render view, you've got one that says SIGB EOTF, click that. If you see these options here, that means it is installed correctly. Congratulations. Now, if we were to give this a render right now, just with these, uh, without changing anything, you would see that it looks, I mean, it's a basic scene. We haven't got my tier to compare it to, but it looks like a standard render. And that's because by default, it is actually still using the SRDB color transform. So that's the default. In case you wanted to go back to it, that's what you would use. But you would actually, to use the Filmic Blender uh, color transform, you're gonna use Filmic Log Encoding Base. Okay, which doesn't sound friendly or like that would be the one, but that is the one, Filmic Log Encoding Base. And then it'll look really washed out. So then you can change your look to one of these. And again, if you just want something simple and easy to go with, you would click Base Contrast. Okay, so that is the five second version of how to use it, how to install it, and to check that it's working. So if you just wanna get started and just start using it, that's basically the, uh, the values that you use, okay? Now, I'm gonna go back to my uh, example scene, my interior, um, and now remember that it was clipping before, okay? And it still is because uh, by default, it is still using the sRGB uh, transfer mode, okay? So watch this, okay? I'm gonna change it to filmic log encoding base and watch the wall, the table, and the chairs. Ah, all right, now, if you look at this and you go, okay, yeah, you fixed that, but you've also got a really gray washed out image, okay? Now, a lot of people, yeah, they try Filmic Blender and they see this and they're like, ugh, doesn't look good, I'm out. Uh, but actually what you're looking at is is quite normal for a you know professional grade camera or a, you know some external renderers. You're seeing the raw file. So it hasn't had a, what's called a LUT lookup table uh, applied to it yet to bring it back to uh, it, its true value, like how it should actually look. So those are found underneath the look section here. So these are the looks there. Remember I said before, base contrast is just an easy one you can click. If you click that, this will give you a render that looks something similar to what you're used to seeing. So these are a range of different contrasts, starting with very low all the way up to uh, very high. Um, and honestly, it's it's personal preference. Um, I find honestly, nine times out of 10, the base contrast looks great. So that's just the one that I use, okay? So yeah, so you can see that there's no longer clipping going on in our, our wall or our chairs or our table. But you might think, okay, yeah, but the scene still looks pretty dark. You haven't fixed that problem that we mentioned before, right? Well, the reason it's still looking dark is, as you might remember, that there wasn't enough bounce lighting coming back into the scene from that sun, okay? And the reason for that is that the sun isn't bright enough. So now that we're using this new Filmic Blender, Filmic Log Encoding Base, <laughs> um, let's try increasing the sun value, okay? So watch this. If As I turn this up, okay, I'm just going to increase it to 50 just to show you we, we still aren't losing information. We're still not clipping at 50. Okay, let's try 100. All right, we're still not, okay? And like, this is a crazy high value, something that you would never consider doing with the old uh, sRGB value mode um, because this would just completely blow out the scene. This would just be, you would never think of using a value like this. Um, so it's, it's kind of like a, like a paradox shift. Like once you switch to Filmic Blender, it requires you to sort of reconsider how you would traditionally light a scene and really crank the values beyond what you normally would. Because you, I don't know, like it, it I noticed it myself when I started using it, I started like, you know, just doing small adjustments, but now I'm, I, you know, I've used it for a little while. I'm just using really big, you know, wild adjustments. So when you first get into it, just get into the habit of like, just trying higher values. And speaking of which, there's actually something else underneath uh, the look here, which is really handy for playing with lighting. And that's one here that says false color. Now, when you click it, you'll see these crazy values and you'll be like, oh, oh okay, I'm out, I'm out. Um, but this isn't designed as a final render. This is designed to visualize the exposure ranges of your scene. 
Okay, so what you're actually seeing is, is kind of like a heat map of what's exposed, what's overexposed, what's not, what's underexposed. So blue is really low exposure. I think black is, I guess, nothing. <laughs> anyway, blue is lo very low exposure. Uh, green is low to mid. Yellow is middle exposure. Red is high exposure. And then white is when it's actually clipping. Okay, so on our wall here, we've got white. Now that's not important because it's, you know, it's a white wall. It probably should clip in this example, right? Um, but you can see that on the, uh, on the table and chairs there, it, it's still in the red range. So I'm actually still not clipping, which means I actually know that I can increase my lighting now. Okay, I might just try dragging it up to like 130 because I know that was sort of the value I used for my final render. Um, and you can see it, like I'm still not even really, like there was a tiny little bit peeking through this. This is probably about as high as I'd go. But this this mode, this false color, like when I first heard of it, I'm like, nah, that's not for me. That's for those technical lighters. But once I started using it, I was like, oh wow, this is really handy. Because normally in Blender, you do a lot of guesswork, like trying to guess what's exposed, what's not. But this just, it does it all for you. Like it's so handy. Even if I didn't have the Filmic Blender uh, attached on top of it, having this look is just, ah, oh, it's so handy. So definitely like when you're lighting your scene, you know, basically this is this is my workflow now. I make sure I'm in Filmic Log Encoding Base for everything from now on. And then I use false color to uh, to check the values. And the cool thing is, is that because it's a, it's a lookup table mode, like it's not a compositing effect or anything like that. You don't need to re-render to see it. You like you can render a final scene and then afterwards change your, your base contrast, you know, whatever, go through this. Um, and you can check your lighting in there and you can also see it in the render view mode. So you, as you're like interactively changing the lighting, you'll see it reflect on everything. So it's just super, super handy um, and um, yeah, just allows you to do so much. So that's the example, and this is the final render once I used it, and you can compare it with the original render, and you can see without a doubt that uh, that this one is is just <laughs> supremely better in every way. Um, it's amazing how something so seemingly unimportant as dynamic range um, can have this carry-on effect to the entire scene and just... I mean, it looks like it was rendered with something else, you know, like it's so, so big. Um, it's just incredible. I, I love it. I just love it so much. Um, now, if you're looking at these two images here and you're thinking, hmm, is it just me or is the one on the right a little bit more desaturated than the one on the left? Well, you would be correct. So this is something that Filmic Blender does that makes it even cooler and that's accurate color desaturation. You see, on film, as parts of the image become more exposed, the colors will naturally start to desaturate. So this happens due to crosstalk between the film layers, and it's something that's unique to film. And while you could call this a technical limitation, it actually looks more pleasing to the eye and actually more natural to what you think you should be seeing. To the point that some DSLR companies today even have software installed on their camera to imitate this effect for the digital format. To show you an example of this, I've got a very basic scene here. I've got three planes and I've got a sun lamp shining down on it. And this is using the sRGB mode, okay? So each of these planes are a different color. We got red, green, and purple. And what I'm gonna do now is just increase this sun lamp to show you why the sRGB is, is not working the way you would hope that it would, okay? So as I increase the strength here, watch how for some really weird reason, the colors have now changed, okay? We've, we've gone from red, green, and purple to yellow, aqua, and pink. But not only that, you can see that as the intensity of the sunlight, the light hitting it grows, these colors never fade out. Now you can imagine if, if somebody was wearing a red shirt, right? and they happen to step into an extremely bright light, like a supernova or something, at some point you wouldn't be able to see it, right? But with sRGB, you will. Even though there's extreme amounts of overexposure, colors will show through almost like they're transparent, like they're this neon effect, and it's just ugly. In fact, you probably have actually already experienced this yourself. Um, if you've ever tried to use the emission shader, 
right? And then tried to make it look like, I don't know, you're making a spaceship and say this was the tailpipe and you wanted to make it look like there's a jet blast going out the back of it. So you increase the uh, emission and what happens? Um, yeah, instead of it fading out to white, which is what your eye would expect to see, it just becomes this this more saturated color and it's ugly. I remember encountering this when I was working on my um, sci-fi drone and um, I just had to fix it in Photoshop. But this is because sRGB is, it's mangling the color data. I can't understand it other than to tell you that. Um, but so now I'll, what I'll do is I'll switch to, let me put this back to diffuse. What I'll do is I'll switch to the filmic blender to show you that. Okay, so look at that, okay? I'll put this back to its uh, previous value of one. Now watch, as we increase this, the hue of these colors isn't changing. And as this increases, as it goes up and up, the colors begin to fade away, which is natural. It's what your eyes should, uh, is expecting to see in this situation. So this is something, it's subtle, and you'll, you'll notice it, like you'll, you'll see it in your render and go like, ooh, nice. Like it just feels nice. It's uh. Yeah, you, you like now that now that you've seen it, you can't unsee it. You, if you go back to the sRGB, you'll be like, "Ugh, these colors just feel ugly," right? Uh, well, now you know the reason why. Um, so to finish, I'll end with a question that a lot of people have, and that's, "Where did all those creative looks go from the color management section? If you've ever used them before, you might be missing them." Well, this may surprise you to hear this, but the looks that come with Blender shouldn't really ever have been used. Now, the reason for this is that they're used for transforming color data, but transformations are only valid for the specific range of color information captured by that camera. So basically, applying it to your render was the equivalent of slapping an Instagram filter on a professional photo. And while it's possible to get a nice result from that, it's much more likely that you were just gonna mangle your data in ways that you can't see. So instead, I'd encourage you all to do your color grading in the compositor with the color balance node, which is a nice segue to my next point, which is that some of the compositor nodes are incorrect too. So just like how the sRGB is incorrect, despite it being included in Blender for so many years, many of the nodes that come with Blender are also incorrect. And by incorrect, I just mean that they're meant for display referred workflows, not the scene referred workflow of Blender. There's some technical stuff you could look up if you wanted to, but that's the basic uh, explanation. So to start with, um, with the color balance node where you should be doing your color grading, um, this correction formula, lift gamma gain, shouldn't be used. You should be using the ASC CDL. Now, don't worry if you don't know this, I didn't know this either, uh, but basically th this has been like this isn't something that the Filmic Blender changes and makes this incorrect. These have been incorrect forever in Blender, right? Around, at least since it's been using the uh, scene referred workflow. So you should be using this, which will do the exact same thing, but it will give you, basically it will hold on to your colors the way they should be held on to. And um, they behave just like you would normally expect, except that this middle one here is the opposite of what you'd expect. So you know, if you wanted to adjust your midtones, you know, um, you wanted to make it yellow, you should be pushing it towards blue, um, vice versa. Um, I'm sure there's a technical reason for that, but that's basically it. Um, so, you know, you can do proper color grading in this. If you want to make it look more saturated, you can do it like that. Um, but yeah, and th this, by the way, is basically what is going on with the Filmic Blender when you change the looks, like basic contrast, low level contrast. It's basically loading in this kind of thing with this, uh, with different amounts of this, with no color, obviously. Um, but there you go. Um, now, there are also a bunch of legacy nodes um, or legacy modes that are included in Blender that shouldn't be used as well. Um, so, for example, in the color mix node, this one right here, um, you know these, these different blend types here? Well, there are a bunch of them that shouldn't be used as well. Now, I know this will, people will be like, what? But multiply, um, screen, divide, dark, light, and overlay, these shouldn't be used. Now, the reason for this is that they are based off the uh, display referred workflow. Um, basically, that they come from the Adobe blend mode. Um, I don't know what this is called, but this is basically 
this document basically outlines these ones here. So everything in this document, the uh, multiply, screen, overlay, darken, light and color dodge, color burn, hard light, soft light, difference and exclusion. They're based off the display referred workflow. So Blender's using a scene referred workflow. So it is mangling the data again. Now, if you think, if you're hearing this, you're thinking like, I haven't noticed any difference. You know, I use them all the time. Uh, I hadn't either as well, okay? I mean, I've just been in close email contact with Troy Sabotka, who's an industry professional who understands color better than me or anybody in the Blender in, um, community, at least that I've seen. Um, and he's he's basically been telling me this and almost everything you've been hearing in this video comes from him. So um, yeah, I'm assuming that he's correct, um, but you know, yeah, if you're wondering why this stuff is included again, because that's always been my question, it's it's like this stuff hasn't been itemized and addressed yet, like because color hasn't really been a priority for Blender, or at least I suppose really talked about in this sort of uh, regard. So there's stuff like this, the multiply, the screen, that stuff, that was from the display referred workflow, we're now in scene referred. It's all very confusing, but basically I'm hoping that this video can help to um, to bring this sort of thing to light so we can at least discuss it, and then maybe in the future this stuff can be removed or changed so that it's uh, it works properly, basically. Um, but there you go. I sincerely hope that people will start using the Filmic Blender color management system. So please help spread the word by sharing this video with any Blender artists that you know, and of course, clicking like so that others can find it more easily. And also, if you make a render using Filmic Blender, if you can use the hashtag Filmic underscore Blender when you post your image online, others will be able to see it more easily and yeah. <laughs> and also, if you're on Twitter, please give Troy Sabotka a shout out and a thank you. He's at Troy underscore S. Uh, he not only made the Filmic Blender, uh, obviously, but also gave up several hours of his time to personally answer my questions via email and also reviewed the script for this tutorial for accuracy. So anyways, thank you all for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.